A self-admitted member of the deep state broke ranks early in the Trump administration. He was a director of strategy at the National Security Council. He'd served in both the Bush and Obama administrations. He went to National Defense University. He knew the ins and the outs of government, but he did something unforgivable to the deep state. This individual dared to write a memo that reached President Trump. The memo was formal and professional. It was about a significant threat, not only to the president, but also to our beloved country. He dared to tell the truth and fulfill his oath of office. He did his job and he was fired for it. The man is Rich Higgins, someone I've known for a dozen years. In fact, the first report I sent on economic warfare landed on his desk. Yet here he was in the Trump administration, fired for doing his job and telling the truth. Almost immediately, the international ridicule and massive media onslaught was directed at him. How ridiculous! No one was out to get Trump. There is no deep state. Three years later, we've all learned the hard way just how right this true whistleblower really was. Join me in the Economic War Room as we meet with Rich Higgins and discuss the memo. Rich Higgins is the vice president of Unconstrained Analytics. He spent 20 years combating terrorism and is an expert on the nexus between theological doctrine and the information age and unconventional warfare. Rich served at the National Security Council in the Trump administration as the director of strategic planning. He was removed in 2017 after warning of a deep state coup to remove the president. In 2004, he formed the Department of Defense's Irregular Warfare Support Program, and he served as the organization's first program manager until June 2010. In this role, he was directly responsible for the creation of several new strategic and operational capabilities. From 2011 to 13, he managed a classified project for Special Operations Command. He's advised the White House, Congress, foreign governments on strategy, technology, and terrorism. He's a U.S. Army veteran, and he holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Tufts University and a Master's Degree in Strategic Security from the National War College. Welcome, Rich Higgins. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Rich, what was it like inside the deep state? It was frustrating at times, um, but you know, we stayed focused on the mission as much as possible. And uh, we just always kept in mind, you know, the guys that were downrange had it a lot harder than we did. And, uh, you know, we got to go home every night. You know, they were living in a tent and eating MREs. Yeah, but you were working in there, and yet you still, you knew all the ins and outs, you knew what everybody was doing and thinking and all the stuff going against President Trump, and yet still you had the guts to write the memo, the original memo. You knew it wouldn't be popular. Why'd you write it? Um, I felt like a lot of people were observing what was going on, but they weren't understanding the, the serious nature of events. I think a lot of people interpreted it as, you know, politics, maybe hyperbolic politics and, you know, rough and tumble. But there was a level of sophisticated orchestration to the events and they were running in parallel with legal things and other things that it, it, it kind of cued me into the fact that this was a lot more than just you know, politics asunder. It was, there was some organization and structure to it. And that's why I started asking questions. And then, you know, I ended up writing it all down because I was frustrated by the fact that there was no conduit by which I could bring this information up to the president through the chain of command because the chain of command itself seemed to have been compromised. Yeah. Well, did you think you'd get fired when you wrote it? Do you think that's, that was the end game for you? Uh, I knew I was taking a chance writing it, but I mean, we, we, you know, I mean, you have to remember how tense things were in early 2017, you know, where, you know, we had daily leaks of the president's telephone calls That's and crazy. I mean, the insanity of it. So, you know, I knew we were in a fight already, a bureaucratic fight, but it was a fight. Well, it's very different. I know you were there in the Bush administration and then the Obama administration, and that's when we worked together the most, was during the Obama years. Tell me about the Obama years. What was it like in the deep state then? 
uh, a clear political agenda put upon everything. Um, you know, it was it was amazing seeing the levels to which the Obama administration would dig down into the bureaucracy. And, you know, in some administrations, you'll see the generals are pressured by the politicians and maybe the senior executives are pressured. But in the Obama administration, that pressure made its way well down into the system so that everybody felt it. And uh, anyone who didn't comport with the party line knew that their career was going to be placed in jeopardy by these political appointees during those years. Um, it was really kind of frightening, to be honest with you. It was, it was profoundly un-American. Well, you saw the purge happen. You saw all these brilliant military officers being forced out because they didn't agree with political matters that had nothing to do with the military. Right, Kevin. It wasn't just that they didn't agree with political matters per se. It's that the, the political matters themselves became ideologically driven. And so, you know, just seeking the truth or seeking the facts, even in you know organizations chartered to do just that, for example, the intelligence community, you know, if you were a fact seeker, you would be punished. If you wanted to speak, you know, factually on China, you would be punished. If you wanted to speak factually on Islam or jihad, you would be punished. So what we're looking at is something very Orwellian. If you didn't toe exactly the line and say the exact things that everybody else, so there's no way to question a policy. If you question a policy in any direction, you're out, right? It wasn't just questioning the policy. It was... It was even, you know, thinking differently or prioritizing your daily schedule differently. I mean, it was, and everybody felt it. So what you saw happen was the organizations over time drifted. And, um, you know, and it took, I would say, probably a good two years before they really had their full control in place. But once it was there, I mean, there was there was nothing standing in their way. They could get away with anything. And one of the other things that let them get away with anything is the fact that they controlled the media. And by controlling the media, you know, there was there was no competing narrative to be heard. Yeah, well, then that's a real clear and present danger to our nation. And you wrote the memo to stand up against that because it continued into the Trump administration. So when when we come back, Rich, I want you to dive into the memo that you wrote so we can clearly see why it was considered so subversive when it was written. I'm sure you've seen the riots and violent protests going on all around the country with calls for defunding the police. This is not a random act based on one man's death. It's a well-funded and coordinated operation, and their goal is to disrupt, demoralize, and deny. America is under attack by an insurgency syndicate, and they're on the offensive. I wanna make sure that your family and your friends are prepared because we're near a tipping point. Here's a quote from Rich Higgins, the former director of strategy at the National Security Council. Not since the Civil War have we faced an insurgency and resistance movement with the capacity capability and very real potential to fundamentally change the structure of our republic. Our team with Rich Higgins' unconstrained analytics team have prepared a very special economic battle plan that includes a comprehensive citizen's guide for response. Simply visit economicwarroom.com forward slash battle plans and click episode 106, a citizen's guide for response link. It's the only one in red. And like all our battle plans, it's absolutely free to download. You'll get powerful information about how to protect your family and you can share it with those you care about. Don't wait. The domestic insurgents are not giving up. Download your free economic battle plan at economicwarroom.com forward slash battle plans. You're one of the small ships that we talk about all the time and you're critical to help save our great nation. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rich Higgins, the man who was fired for daring to tell the truth to President Trump about the deep state. So let's get right into it. Rich, walk through the memo that you wrote in 2017 and what you wanted the NSC and the president to know. Well, I think the most important thing that I wanted them to understand was that um, political warfare is real warfare. Um, that things that you know, there's a very small subset of the national security community that operates in this area. This is, you know, black propaganda, psychological warfare, information warfare. 
And so what I was trying to do is present for, you know, the president and his staff, um, you know, an ontology, a, a, some, some way for them to understand what was happening to them beyond just them reacting to the political headlines of the day. Uh, and that got into, you know, some of the specific tactics I knew we were seeing, right, where we had uh, penetrations and subversion. We saw, you know, a concerted propaganda campaign with the Russia hack the election stuff. But you know, to let them understand that there was a lot more organizational structure and decision making behind this that was obvious to somebody who knew what they were looking for. And in so doing, what I hoped to have them recognize is that there were countermeasures that they could put in place to deal with it. Um, well, let's talk you know, about just a second. Let, you mentioned the term cultural Marxism. Mm -hmm. What does that term mean? I, I, some people have heard it, but very few. What does it mean? Is it real? Give us some examples. I think the I think the the simplest way to explain it to the layman who isn't familiar with it is the the Marxists recognized that one of the real strengths in the West, particularly the Soviets, but others as well, that one of the real strengths of the West was our Judeo-Christian cultural basis. So what they knew is that to get to the United States, you didn't need to completely invert the United States. You needed to move it away from its true north, its true north, which was, you know, the belief in God, the idea that every individual is created in the image of God, and from that basis, you begin moving them off of that. And so they got into uh, cultural institutions: our music, our movies, our literature, our art. And in so doing, they they don't necessarily have to completely deform it; they just have to deform it a little bit it becomes much less resistant to the Marxist belief system at that point. And you've seen it over the years, it's very real. What I think people misunderstand is that there's a degree of intention behind it that you know you, you simply adopt by, by participating, okay? And it's the nature of the design. Like you don't, there are a lot of people who are unwittingly Marxist you know, because of belief systems imparted upon them through the music they listen to. Uh, or the value system that those arts that they, you know, whether it be movies or whatever, that art that they watch inculcates them with. And it's slowly done over time. And what we see now is, um, you know, 60 or 70 or 80 years, really 100 years, and, you know, starting 2017, 100 years on into the Marxist revolution, post-Soviet revolution, here we are, right? So I think... For the for the average person, I, I, I don't want to complicate the idea. I mean, it's it's very simple. And, and I think one of the problems that we've had in the past is there's been a level of deniability afforded cultural Marxism, right? There's, oh, that's just conspiracy. You don't have to pay attention right. to that. Pull up something from the 1950s, an old TV show or movie. There are good guys and bad guys. Oh, no Clear question. Good guys and bad guys, right? And then pull up a movie today. But you know, it, and often, right. In the 1950s, though, I, I, I knew a man, uh, I, I wasn't alive in the 50s, but I knew a man named W. Cleon Skousen, and I actually worked with him, my father worked with him, and he wrote a book, The Naked Communist, and he talked about all of these things in the 1950s. They got entered in the congressional record in the 1960s. You go back and read that, it's like a history lesson of exactly what's happened in the last 40, 50 years. Right. Well, even today, you can pick up and you can read Manning Johnson to understand Black Lives Matter. I mean, there's nothing really new here. Um, you know, the you go back and you listen to testimony from the House on American Activities Committee, and they talked about you know labeling Americans as racist, and they talk about hating America first. Or it's, I mean, you know, it's it's the the challenge we have is the cultural Marxism has been so effective at penetrating our educational institutions, to include our national security educational institutions, that. Most Americans, even professional trained defense department, you know, military officers, intelligence officers, they don't know this stuff. Uh, the guys I learned this stuff from are all in their late 70s and early 80s, you know, and, and functioned, you know, operating against this adversary at the high levels in the Cold War. Yeah. Um, there aren't many of there aren't many of them around today who really understand it at that level. No doubt. Well, you talk about a battle space and we talk about the battle space all the time. But then you dive in, in section three, you talk about the enemy campaign plan. You say there's an overt line of effort, publicity, and then four covert lines of effort. Can you describe a little bit about how that operates? I think the most important thing to understand about the publicity line of effort is that 
what you're trying to when, what you're providing in the publicity line of effort is a, is a is a holding pen. It's a catch narrative that's propagated across mainstream media and social media that you're trying to drive people towards. You know, a contemporary example of that is um, you know where uh, you know Trump, Trump is a you've seen it just in the past couple of days. Trump is a racist, right? Or Trump doesn't disavow white supremacy. That's how they're starting to move him in this direction. Then what you'll see is they'll have black propaganda, psychological, or a bunch of techniques will be deployed over the next several days to include using key influencers on the Republican side, which we see with John Roberts and others, that will be shaping people into that narrative stream. And these are really sophisticated psychological warfare techniques that, you know, the average person just isn't exposed to. But we know these, and you knew these in, when you were working inside the Department of Defense. You saw these being used in other countries, and now they're being used against us. Right, exactly. That was the thing that was most shocking about everything is that you've seen, you know, I mean, in, in, in retrospect, you look back, and we didn't, we didn't know we were looking at what is now known as you know, Crossfire Hurricane and the FBI counterintelligence operation, although, you know, we could clearly see parts of the elephant. Uh, now we now we have a much a much better picture of what was actually going on. I, I have to be honest with you, I, I still don't think we've seen all of it. I think there's a there's a lot of more stuff that's still to be discovered. And I, I really hope that Attorney General Barr and Durham, uh, you know, bring it forward to, to public light. I mean, we desperately need sunlight on this this mess. Well, we've seen a lot of warriors get hit, like General Flynn, and then our, our mutual friend who passed away, Phil Haney, uh, and, and a lot of people that have fought this fight, and, and it's a bloody war, it really is. Uh, we're we're going to take another break, and when we come back, we're going to get uh, into the, really, what can we do about this? So I'm going to ask Rich, how do we solve the deep state problem? It's obvious that this is a war for the future of America, and it will not end with the election. So stay tuned as we develop an action plan to save America. We'll be back right after the break. I'm sure you've seen the riots and violent protests going on all around the country with calls for defunding the police. This is not a random act based on one man's death. It's a well-funded and coordinated operation, and their goal is to disrupt, demoralize, and deny. America is under attack by an insurgency syndicate, and they're on the offensive. I wanna make sure that your family and your friends are prepared because we're near a tipping point. Here's a quote from Rich Higgins, the former director of strategy at the National Security Council. Not since the Civil War have we faced an insurgency and resistance movement with the capacity capability and very real potential to fundamentally change the structure of our republic. Our team with Rich Higgins' unconstrained analytics team have prepared a very special economic battle plan that includes a comprehensive citizen's guide for response. Simply visit economicwarroom.com forward slash battle plans and click episode 106, a citizen's guide for response link. It's the only one in red. And like all our battle plans, it's absolutely free to download. You'll get powerful information about how to protect your family and you can share it with those you care about. Don't wait. The domestic insurgents are not giving up. Download your free economic battle plan at economicwarroom.com forward slash battle plans. You're one of the small ships that we talk about all the time and you're critical to help save our great nation. We're speaking with Rich Higgins, the man who formed the Irregular Warfare Support Group at the Department of Defense. He also served as the Director of Strategic Planning at the National Security Council. He was a card-carrying member of the deep state who sacrificed his career to warn the president. Rich, is it too late to save our constitutional republic? No, it's not too late. I mean, I, I, think, I think, candidly, the great gift that the president, President Trump, has bestowed upon this country is he has exposed in, in great clarity what's happening here. Um, you know, I don't know if he's going to be able to fix it. I mean, it took a long time to get here, right? I mean, his job was to kind of do the demolition, to show where the rot was, and to begin to kind of you know pull out the mold and pull out the old rotten wood 
and then we can start the restoration project. But it will require like you know a, a true American restoration. Yeah, no doubt. Well, I want to thank you because you wrote that original memo, which sparked a lot of this and it brought it to the president's attention. I think he naively went in thinking, oh, you know, I'm at the helm of government. We'll let all these other people, they work for me. And so they'll, they'll work for me. And of course, they were working against him. And your memo woke a lot of people up, drew a lot of ridicule, but also woke people up. And that's important. But you've got a new book out on this uh, with the title, it's The Memo, 20 Years Inside the Deep State Fighting for America First. Tell us about that book. I read it last night. I think it's fascinating. I think I wrote, I wrote the book like you were saying. Uh, yeah, the, the, attack against, the attack against anybody who's a truth teller tends to be, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. And I was pounded pretty heavily with that. Part of this is just a reclaiming of my voice, right? I mean, that's part of it for me. Uh, I also wanted to give people uh, kind of an insider's perspective on, on you know, what it's like actually functioning inside the system. So the, the book is you know, an attempt to kind of lay out the surface level what a 20 year career working inside, particularly the counterterrorism and special warfare communities looks like when you're battling against the, you know, a Bush administration that didn't want to really talk about Islam, or Jihad, then you're dealing with the Obama administration, and they're working basically in alliance with the Muslim Brotherhood and these Marxist groups. Um, and then what you'll see in the story and what I hope people take away from it is, you know, there's a reason President Trump got elected. And there are a lot of folks inside the bureaucracy today, to include these national security organizations that support President Trump and what he's trying to do. Um, but for years, they've been pushed to the side. And um, one big part about fixing the problem is going to be identifying those people and then putting them in the, into leadership positions where they can bring these institutions back into line with the republic. Yeah. Well, you identify some of them in the book, which is you know, incredible. And, and you mentioned in there, uh, you know, we share a mutual fr friend in Jenny Thomas. And you mentioned passing on lists of names of people that needed to be forced out because they were problems, right? Well, yeah, there were there were people who were problems. I mean, G Ginny, first off, Ginny is one of those patriots who's been involved, you know, fighting the good fight for years along with her husband. They, they're just great people, right? They're personal friends. Um, you know, when it came to the inside track, the thing I found was most frustrating in terms of like identifying the problems inside the system was there was an open reluctance on the entire, you know, on the, on the part of the entire national security leadership staff through the transition to see this. And the book is going to reveal a little bit about, you know, people often ask, how did these people get in here? How did General Mattis get into the administration? Well, this book's going to answer some of those questions in great detail. And it's, it's a story that's not just about the Trump administration, though. It's a story about what's going on inside the government writ large and how the Trump administration fits into that. Yeah. Well, getting this book, I'm telling our audience, get this book and read it, share it. It may be the first step in waking up a sleeping America. And we're going to have to go around the media because the media is not our friend. We're almost right rich running a counterinsurgency here. And, and this book is one of the steps that people can take uh, to helping be part of that effort. Yeah, in some respects, I, I, I say this sometimes and when I'm giving quiet you know, talks on the on the road is, we're, we're the insurgents now in many ways. We're insurgents in our own homeland. And um, you know, if, if, if anything, I think you know, President Trump needs to uh, embrace you know, his role as the leadership in it. And uh, you know, I, I believe he's gonna get reelected. And when he does on November 4th, I think you're gonna see him move very deliberately to take the country in the direction it needs to go. You know, we may see the, be the best second term of a president Normally, the first term of a president is strong. They come in with fire in their belly and they put their people in place and they get a lot accomplished. The second term is, you know, sometimes a letdown because the deep state empire strikes back. In, in yeah. this case, it, with President Trump, it may be the opposite. If the first term had too much of the empire in it. The second term, he now is a, fully aware of the problem and he may just clean house and, and put phenomenal people and we may see the best second term of a president in the history of this country. I think so too. I mean, we we have a long way to go, and I you know I hope your I hope your uh, audience is uh, is in for the fight. Yeah. So uh, ordinary Americans need to get in this too, and and to get the book. 
What's the best location? Do you want them to go to your website, unconstrainedanalytics.org? Is that the best place? Best, well, look, you can get the book on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or wherever, okay? Um, you, know, you can check out Rich Higgins, the memo. Dot com if you want to go there. It's got a little bit about my background and bio, and we may even talk about the economic warfare project on there for you, Kevin. But but the you know the the, the biggest thing is um, you know I, I'm 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 not out to sell books. I'm, I'm trying to help people. You know here I want to tell people a story, and the, I think the story does a good job of conveying why Trump. You know, and, and so many people have doubted him or questioned his, you know, the tactics he's used and so on and so forth. He's a quick learner, but he he has admitted, you know, I made a couple of mistakes early on. I'm a quick learner. He I, I believe in his heart. He knows that he's got this mission and uh, it, he, he's going to need troops. And, you know, if the, the average American who's sitting at home or what can I do? You know, he, he told you the other night. You can get involved in the you can get involved in the election. You know, you can be an observer. You can get out involved in your school committee. You know, you, the the old conservative model of sitting at home, that's over. No. You have to get engaged. And you've given a counter narrative. You've given the truth, which is, you know, the, if you turn on the TV, you'll see what the media wants you to see, which really lends itself to the deep state, to cultural Marxism, and all of that. But right. what we talk about in the economic war room all the time, we tell the story of Dunkirk and how the small ships made a big difference. It can't just be the government. It can't just be elected officials like you shared. And our audience is powerful. We've accomplished some pretty amazing things. Uh, we went against the thrift savings plan. We talked about returning pharmaceutical man manufacturing to the United States. We're now fighting the fight against Ant Group and the Chinese uh, efforts to take over our stock market and so forth. This audience can make a real difference. If we do nothing when our republic is under attack, then we abdicate our responsibility as citizens and as patriots. If we allow ourselves to be canceled, to be silenced, to be scared, to be subdued and compliant, we will fail in our duty to the nation. This is your opportunity. Join Rich Higgins. Read his book, The Memo, and join him as a small ship to make a difference. Get educated. You can get our free battle plan at economicwarroom.com, which will include uh, access to where you can get the memo and buy Rich's new book. Rich, thank you so much for joining us in Economic War Room, and thank you for fighting the fight as a patriot.